This is Dr. David Shine, and welcome to Business Law 101. Now, all of us, we have corporate culture. Now, even if you have a small practice, um, you know, you hang out, you shingle down there in Clear Lake or in another place, then you're still going to have a, a practice. You most likely will have staff working for you. If you're successful, you'll probably add more CPAs. You're also going to have, hopefully, lots of clients. And you're going to want to have a business. So sometimes people see this word corporate culture and they say, ah, oh, that's General Motors. That's not me. You know what, folks? Even if you're running a little tiny business, even if you're dealing with your kid's school district, I just mentioned HISD or you know suburban district, there is an approach to how we do things. In fact, I just mentioned school districts. One of the most contentious issues across our entire society right now is how our school districts treat our children and what material is covered and things like that. This is a very contentious issue. So you can compare that. That is a corporate culture. It's the culture of those school districts. And a lot of people are saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's not how we see the appropriate culture for those school districts. So I just want you to kind of compare some of the things that you're seeing in these slides and say, what would be parallel to this in my day-to-day -day world, okay? So I want you to think about that, but I can tell you that I, I was with two, uh, in my early career right after law school, I was with two Fortune 50 corporations. I was with Shell Oil, uh, which is the big daddy of big daddies and still is. And uh, then I was with Teneco Inc., uh, the oil company owned by Teneco Inc., which at the time was one of the largest corporations in the world. And it was very interesting because I can tell you that that corporate culture, both at Shell at the time and at Teneco at the time, was dramatically, dramatically different than what we would expect corporate culture to be today. Uh, and I mean, that's the 1980s, during the 19th, most of the late 70s through the 1980s, I was with these big, uh, big companies. And um, I can tell you that the concepts of diversity, the concepts of environmental, the concepts of even how you treat your customers, dramatically, dramatically different than they are today. So certainly having a positive corporate culture. Uh, one of the fun things I got to do some years ago is um, uh, many of you know that Southwest Airlines, of course, had a horrendous experience over the Christmas holidays, bad weather caused things. And a lot of their employees came out of the woodwork and said, you know what, these guys didn't update their computer system when they had a chance with all that federal money during COVID. And they were not prepared to deal with the weather emergency. And, and it, it caused horrendous, horrendous problems. I know one uh, family rented a car in Denver, Colorado. I think, I don't know if they were up there, a family visitor up there for snow skiing, any event. They rented a car in Denver, Colorado, and drove to Houston. Folks, that's a serious hike, but that's how bad the situation was. They needed to get back to Houston. And um, the, the point is, though, is that in the early days of Southwest Airlines, one reason they became such a significant company was because they had a real hardcore corporate culture called do the right thing. And in fact, the, the retired president released a book in 2008, and that's actually called Do the Right Thing. That's actually the name of the book. And I was doing radio at the time, and I had a chance to interview this uh, a retired president. And the book is fascinating because it specifically says you treat your employees well, and that's the key to providing good customer service. And you notice that there are a lot of complaints today about Southwest Airlines not being responsive to its employees, and therefore it's not being responsive to its customers. So this corporate culture has, a, has an upside to downside. It's pretty interesting stuff. And then, uh, you know, uh, codes of ethics and things like that. Hey, you know what, folks? Corporate codes of ethics don't mean anything. We're gonna keep this clean here, folks. Catholic University. Uh, the corporate codes of ethics don't mean anything if you're not following them. And what was interesting to me is one of the best written corporate codes of ethics 
was Enron's. Not something he came up with later, but the code of ethics that was in place at the time that Enron was doing all of this bad stuff out there. The, the written code of ethics didn't mean anything. That wasn't how they did business. Um, I, I, I hope I haven't mentioned this before, but I have a friend, um, a good friend of mine, I had dinner with him the last two weeks. Uh, he, in his early career, right out of his MBA program, worked for uh, Enron in the mid-1990s. And the organization was so corrupt, as soon as he got there, he said, I needed to get out of here. This was never going to work for me because it was such a corrupt organization. This is the mid-90s. Remember, they didn't go bankrupt until 2001. <laughs> but unfortunately, because he had a lot of school debt and uh, so forth, and he had moved to Houston for the opportunity, uh, he, um, he ended up being there about six months. Uh, continuously looking for a new job while he was there. But he said things did not get better in the six months he was there. So this corporate culture can be pervasive. It can be in both directions. But again, it's not about the code of ethics. It's about the practical code. How do you run your organization? And this focus on organizational culture and creating a positive ethical climate. This is Dr. David D. Shine for Business Law 101. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favorite platform.